Hello, I'm Tara Brabazon and I'm the Dean of Graduate Studies at Charles Darwin University and welcome to this, our new video series for higher degree students at CDU. And yes, it is called Outrider. This first episode is called Summoning the Outrider. We explain how we got here. But my role for you is to be a human jukebox. So if there's anything, any topic in your candidature that's worrying you or exciting you or you want some information on, drop me an email and I will do the research and I will gather that information for you. Yay, exciting. So for the wonderful CDU students and colleagues at CDU. Thank you so much for the opportunity that you've given me and I hope we have a blast. And for all our friends from around the world who are joining us on this journey, we thank you for being you and we thank you for your time. So this first episode of Outrider explores why I chose this word and the word, the trope, was chosen with a real agenda with a real purpose. And I chose the word outrider as a guide through this complicated, difficult, troubling, pretty frightening time. It's a word that is tough. It's a word that is persistent. It's a word that is robust, but it's also a word of visioning. So what is an outrider? And why is it meaningful for higher degree students? Why is it meaningful to our transforming ideas of teaching and learning and research? And why is it significant to our new and emerging understandings of citizenship? Well, the first mention of outriders existed in the 1530s. They were known as mounted escorts. So they would ride ahead of the main group and gather information, check for safety and find the best way forward for the people that were to follow. So the outrider existed as this interesting, quite quirky, weird, significant person who opened the way and would find information, being a forerunner, if you will. So from this first definition, you can see why I thought, hmm, this is interesting, this word can do something for us in our research. So my job, in many ways, as the Dean of Graduate Studies, is to escort you through your degree, to bring you timely, important and urgent information and make sure that your vista is clear. So my job is to accompany you on this journey. Now, what's so amazing about the word outrider is in the 2010s, the word started to change once more and it gained this incredible infusion of popular cultural information. But what I also need to tell you is the definition started to twist and transform to represent someone who was an outsider, who chose actively to walk in a different way, to be outside of the main group and decide not to follow the trends. Now, for me, that's probably the best definition of a PhD student like ever. On this planet, only 1% of the planet Earth population holds a PhD. 1% of the world's population. So we are a group that has chosen to be different. We have chosen to be defiant. We have made a decision to choose a different path, to challenge ourselves and create new knowledge. So if you think, we spend our doctoral programs creating a sock. No, not the thing on your feet. A significant original contribution to knowledge. Think about that. Significant original contribution to knowledge. We make a decision to be ahead of the main group. We make a decision to work against the trend. We are different and we are defiant. We make a decision to occupy a different space, an adjacent space, to gain a different view of the world and to sit and listen to alternative stories and try to understand the silences. The outrider also has some pretty important popular culture etymology as well. And of course, that's why we've got here. And as you expected, of course, there is a Star Wars bit here in Star Wars Legends. The outrider was Dash Rendar's freighter, of course, and it is a playable ship 
on Shadows of Empire and can I say it's also a toy I've bought that toy and the toy will be arriving soon and in a future Outrider you will see the toy Outrider cool but what's significant and what the Star Wars moment adds to our definition is that the Outrider existed in Star Wars in the interregnum, in these in-between times. So beyond Star Wars, of course, we have the game Outrider released in April 2021 for Xbox and PlayStation. And that game also impacted on me selecting Outrider, if I'm honest with you, because it's set in the mid-21st century, so a reasonably recent and close future for us. And what's happened in Outrider is that the world ignored the climate emergency and it became a climate disaster and humans now have to leave the planet because there's basically nothing left. And so an Earth-like planet has been discovered called Enoch. And a group of people called Outriders go ahead of the population of planet Earth to prepare Enoch for its new citizens. So it's a, th a third person shooter game. It has some interesting role playing elements to it. And from this etymology, and I think also from this pretty recent popular cultural history, we commence this series for you, for our higher degree students at CDU, Outrider. So let me explain to you how we're going to temper and how we're going to use this history. And we're going to use it for all of us. We're all on a professional development journey here. We're all on a transformational journey together. Because what the Outriders do, like the best researchers, is that we locate societal threats that are not seen by others. The notion that the academic researcher is an outsider and is invisible, unpopular, if you will. And of course, this is the time where clever people, smart people are pretty unpopular. So much of academic life at the moment is about fitting in about simply complying to metrics and reaching those stretch targets. So we network, we peer review, we ask for references and we need to secure referees to get on. So what being an academic is now, I think, it's about being small, being less and working with very little. And so this series occupies a different space. We open out new intellectual terrain. Let's be academic outsiders together. Let's be academic outriders, being ahead of the threats, but also being proactive rather than reactive. That's my mantra for this year. Proactive, not reactive. So we're not going to play small here. No, no. So much of our culture at the moment, so much of academic culture at the moment wants us to play small, be small, be less. For us as outriders, we're going to loom large. We are going to live large. We're going to ask and we're going to answer the really difficult questions of our time. And of course, we have some really important historical leaders to follow and we must gain inspiration from these people. And I want to summon the names of these inspirational humans for us as we commence our journey today. Now, the first name I need to obviously summon is Antonio Gramsci, the writer of The Prison Notebooks. Now, Gramsci is important because he was imprisoned by the Benito Mussolini regime because he was a threat to the fascists. And importantly, he was a threat to the fascists because of his writing. His writing was that powerful 
and that explosive. Now, Gramsci reached probably academic popularity in the 1980s, and it has been sort of, you know, popularity has gone down. There's always academic trends. But what's significant is <laughs> through the 21st century, Gramsci is back to try and sort of explain the madness that we've been living since 2001. And why Gramsci matters to us is he invented and summoned the phrase organic intellectual. So what is an organic intellectual? An organic intellectual critiques the notion that we are all sort of disinterested scholars, that we critique the notion of this traditional intellectual as a person who you know, holds universal truths and generalizable knowledge. Gramsci argues that such a traditional intellectual maintains the status quo and reinforces already existing power structures and power inequalities. He argued that the unspoken assumption of intellectual activity is to reinforce injustice. Wow. Now, obviously, when we're all moving through an undergraduate degree or we're in a PhD, we're not waking up in the morning and going, what can I do to reinforce capitalism and the patriarchy today? We don't do that. It's not as overt as that. But the argument that Gramsci makes is that the traditional intellectual is pivotal to maintaining rationality, consensus and homogeneity. In other words, the traditional intellectual exists to block a consideration of hard alternatives. So when we are part of a university, when we are a legitimate intellectual, we have to fulfill our role. So let's think about your role in a PhD. As we've talked about, you're here to create a significant original contribution to knowledge. But are you really? How are you doing that? Well, firstly, you're looking at existing literature. That is, you're looking at the already existent traditional knowledge systems. And then you're using agreed and tested methods to just push knowledge just a little bit. But what if the literature is wrong? What if you're asking the wrong questions? What if you are simply providing the knowledge that grant agencies and funders and empowered people want you to discover? You see, so much of traditional education is repetitive, cumulative, coordinating existing ideas, creating, of course, common sense. The organic intellectual is different. This is a very unstable identity. It is contingent and it's not a comfortable space team because what the organic intellectual does is move into spaces that are rarely seen to hold knowledge. So the identity is relative liminal in between. So they are the outriders. Gramsci argues that so much of education, so much of learning, involves just simple repetition of old ideas that reinforce existing power structures. So this means the truths of our time, common sense, survive far longer than is rational, logical or beneficial. Teaching generation after generation after generation this traditional commonsensical knowledge. Now for Gramsci, he argued that education must be much, much more than this. Differences, uncomfortable, troubling, in your face differences start to bubble through life. So this isn't simply a matter of restating the sociological mantras of race, class, gender, etc. It's about understanding and summoning concepts that don't fit easily into a scholar's toolbox. So the organic intellectual starts to challenge, starts to research, starts to understand uncommon sense. 
So the role of the organic intellectual is not to create your nicely legitimized knowledge system. No, your role is to critique that legitimized knowledge system, to show how the truths we take for granted right now need to be justified, need to be explained rather than simply assumed. So class-based inequality needs to be assessed, needs to be researched rather than simply assuming class and injustice has always existed. Similarly, why are black men in jail in greater numbers than white men? Do we assume, oh, that's just sort of the way it is? Or do we research that? We probe that. We ask the difficult questions, why? Why is that happening? So as you can see, the organic intellectual is a maker, is a communicator and intervenes in practice and intervenes in theory. The organic intellectual suspends common sense and reveals the provisional nature of truths and knowledge and stories that we've been hearing all our lives. Now, this is inspiring, Whew, particularly now. Although I think we're certainly living through unfortunate times, problematic times, truly weird times, and we've got this really worrying context that's encircling our universities at the moment. You think about it, we've got climate change, we've got pollution, we've got water insecurity, we've got food insecurity, we've got housing insecurity, unemployment, underemployment, the casualised economy. And that's before we even move to, say, Trump or Brexit or the daily attacks on intellectuals, let alone clever people. So as you can see, it's no longer possible for us to do business as usual. If we continue doing this business as usual, then we are complicit in the disempowerment of others. The organic intellectual crafts and configures a separate space, an outrider space that's just ahead, grinding out new ways of thinking, grinding out new knowledge. So the reason why some of the most empowering and inspiring researchers on planet Earth today are Indigenous colleagues, Indigenous researchers, is because <laughs> they have not been historically welcomed into our universities. And there's a reason for that. Universities are, they remain, colonising institutions. So the organic intellectual allows human beings who have come from a place where educational success was not expected or not rewarded or applauded, if you will, to be recognised. It allows those, all of us, who were never expected to be successful or clever or interesting in any way, shape or form, it allows us to claim and craft a space for difference. So we become outriders and we create new spaces for knowledge and then other people can follow us. Now here, team, we're not denying who we are. We're in fact using who we are, using our truths, our injustices, our prejudices, our history, our narratives to make a better knowledge, to make a tougher knowledge to make a more rigorous knowledge and yes to build a more socially inclusive future. Think about the organic intellectual from your perspective in a doctoral program. If you think about it your original contribution to knowledge only emerges when you do a literature review and you push it a little bit and you look at existing methods and push it a little bit. You need to do better than that. We need to get beyond the taken-for-granted traditional knowledge system. So much of traditional education is blocking these sorts of big ideas and big topics. Okay, so so much for Antonio Gramsci fighting fascism. The other great outrider I want to summon for us is the legendary and late Professor Bell Hooks, best known for her research on class, on race, but also on feminism, she was fascinated through her life about how unjust systems are perpetuated, 
how inequalities continue. Isn't that a great life project? Now, she wrote her doctorate on Toni Morrison, great thesis too, and went on to produce a range of transgressive and transformative monographs, including Teaching to Transgress. I read that when I was a very, very young academic, Transformed How I Think About Teaching, and also Ain't I a Woman, Black Women and Feminism. But it's her 1984 book that's so interesting to me, Feminist Theory from Margin Descent. And now I would argue in terms of feminist theory, the book has dated, so it's an, of historical relevance, but it's her theorization of marginality that I think is more relevant now than perhaps even when it was written. She's interested in how the notion of the marginal develops consciousness and an understanding of change. Her work gained an incredible surge of popularity once more through the murder of George Floyd. People were just trying to understand how could that degree of inhumanity occur? And Professor Bell Hawkes provided some very clear answers to how and why that can occur, and it will occur again unless we do something. So Bell Hawkes brought to us an understanding of the margin and the marginal, and she took on the notion that the marginal groups, communities, are being allowed a voice. That she argued that was a patronising position through which disempowered communities could express themselves. So what Hooks did, it was this interesting night move. She not only brought the margin to the centre, but she argued, and this was an incredible rhetorical flourish, she argued that the margin is actually the centre. She stated, quote, for me, the space of radical openness is the margin, a profound edge. Locating oneself there is difficult, yet necessary. It is not a safe place. One is always at risk. End of quote. Wow. So the margins are not places of oppression or deprivation, but of radical possibility. Oh, yeah and resistance. The margins are a beginning. They're the place to write a new narrative, to imagine an alternative world. The outrider transforms the margins into the new centres. Therefore, we create new knowledges. We live and work and play and research on what Hooks described as, quote, a profound edge, end of quote. Now, there are so many outriders that I could talk about. I hope through the series we get a chance to talk through as many of these as you would like me to talk through. But there's so many people that can inspire our intellectual work. And I acknowledge A. Robert Lee's remarkable monograph, Modern American Counter Writing. Really, really great book, that. But, you know, I often think about Hunter Thompson and his configuration of all those imagined geographies where he would sort of walk, well, actually, he would drive, you know, drive towards chaos, drive towards violence, drive towards change. He would, you know, drive towards poverty and war and it just an incredible man, but he would move towards the problem rather than away from it. And then, of course, we have the absolutely incomparable uh, uh, Joan Didion. I'm the biggest fan of Joan Didion, can I say. She was writing about being a writer, writing about writing. And her point in her writing, I'm getting quite emotional, but her point in writing was so that we would understand and recognise us and others, that we would understand the marginal, the excluded, the frightened and the lost. She wrote of an interior landscape of grief and death and discomfort, and she understood strongly the power of disruption. There are so many people, so many profound outriders that we can claim in this series and in our lives. The legendary Howard Zinn, the crazy and wonderful Paul Virilio, people that just sort of don't fit anywhere. <laughs> who have intentionally distanced themselves from the assumed, the accustomed, the taken for granted. People who do not accept and will never accept 
but have to be persuaded. This Outrider series, like Hunter S. Thompson, we walk, we drive, we walk towards the errors, the fears, the scars on the landscape. We walk towards them. The pain, <laughs> the mistakes, the missteps are not hidden. They're not masked. But the mistakes and the errors are used to locate a different way of thinking and writing and researching and indeed living. This is the Outrider series for the scholars who don't fit and are sick to death of retelling the story we've been hearing all our lives. We are now looking differently, a view askew, if I can quote Kevin Smith. And it also summons the popular culture that shouldn't be popular culture. It's the unpopular culture that's also popular, whether we're talking about the legendary Pet Shop Boys, we love you Pet Shop Boys, but Lewis Capaldi, or indeed great things like Lizzo and Jack Black in The Mandalorian. Gonna work? No, I don't know what that's about either. Fantastic though, isn't it? So it's this unpopular weirdness that somehow sort of sneaks into the light. And I've always shared with my students that the most valuable knowledge is that which hides in the light. The most valuable questions are the ones that we are not asking. So in this series, you know what? We're going to ask these questions and we're going to answer these questions. We are going to walk beyond, way beyond the normal and the pleasant and the easy. We are not going to recreate the narratives of the safe and the powerful because a narrative has credibility. A narrative carries power with it. So think about all those chronological narratives that we were taught at school. And too often these chronological narratives were referred to as history, often with a capital H. Fact upon fact upon fact upon fact in a chronological narrative. And it almost has a propulsion, create a relentlessness created through one damn fact after another. But the point of a chronological narrative is to stop critical thinking, to stop us all thinking that, you know what, there are other facts, deep truths that exist that are being completely ignored in between this narrative structure. These other facts critique often destroy the credibility that has been invested in these chronological narratives. Now, my first two degrees were in history in a really, really <laughs> conservative university. And I was this working class girl. I didn't have the right accent. I still don't really. Um, I don't dress appropriately. I still don't really. And I didn't go to the right school that posh people are meant to go to. And I was being taught these chronological narratives that excluded the overwhelming majority of the population. So social history, oral history, women's history were only just emerging and just starting to be taught when I did my degrees. And post-structuralism, much to my amusement in my degree, only had one seminar in my honours year. So, you know, I was going through this degree and wondering, where are the unemployed where are the underemployed? Where are the poor? Where are the people with impairments or disabilities? Where are the migrants? Where are the loners? Where are the lonely? So outside of that coursework, I started to do radically <laughs> different reading. And when I was enrolled in the third year of my history degree, I was sitting in the library coffee shop with a precious, precious book. And I bought this book with money that I did not have. So when I was sitting in the coffee shop, because I bought this book, I couldn't actually afford a coffee. But I was in the coffee shop and I had this book. And it was not on any reading list forever. And I'd only bought this book because I really loved the cover and I really loved the book title. And the title was, it was written by Greel Marcus, and the title was Lipstick Traces, A Secret History 
of the 20th century. And I remember the moment, team, when I read the paragraph on the top of page six. And I remember where I was sitting. I remember the table. I remember the time of day. I remember the angle of the light when I was reading that paragraph. And let me share that paragraph with you from Greil Marcus. Quote, what is history anyway? Is history simply a matter of those moments that leave behind those things that can be weighed and measured? New institutions, new winners, new losers. Or is history also a result of those moments that seem to leave nothing behind? Nothing but the mystery of spectral connections between people long separated by place and time. If the language they are speaking the impulse they are voicing has its own history. Might it not tell a very different story from the one we've been hearing all our lives? End of quote. My life, certainly my intellectual life, but my life changed when I read that paragraph. And everything I've done since that, I read it when I was 20, Everything I've done in my life comes from that single paragraph. So the work we do together in this Outrider series is to, together, let's listen to that different language, to understand the spectral connections between people long separated by place and time. So you know what? Let's write together those different stories and challenge those stories that we've been hearing all our lives. Let's together walk to the edge of knowledge. Let's together create a different relationship between ontology, epistemology and methodology. Let us ask the difficult questions that no one wants answered and let's drive towards <laughs> radical, difficult and defiant theory. May we have a blast. Contact me anytime I am here to serve. I wish you love, light and peace. Tea out.